Restless Mind with David Dillard Wright, the podcast that takes you into a space of tranquility, abundance, and freedom. The guided meditations and bonus content that you are about to hear will remove worry from your life and help you to release obstacles on your path. Learn key insights from philosophy, spirituality, and psychology to support your journey to greater mindfulness and well-being. Now is the time to open your heart and mind to Boundless Inspiration. Hello, I'm David Dillard Wright. Welcome to The Boundless Mind. We'll be talking about some ways to help you live a calm, centered, and abundant life. You can follow me on Twitter at David Dillard Wright. That's at D-A-V-I-D-D-I-L-L-A-R-D-W-R-I. Or check out my meditation books at Amazon.com or wherever books are sold. Today's show, we'll be continuing our Nine Gates series, and we'll be talking about the qualities of generosity, forbearance, patience, and contentment. Each show, we begin with a meditation, and then we continue with the topic for the day. Today's meditation is called Interconnection and Change as Fundamental Reality. We begin with a quote from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. When I roam the life cycle driven by strong hallucinations, may the host of mild and fierce lords lead me on the path of the light that conquers terrifying visions of hate and fear. And that's the end of the quotation. One of the basic themes of Asian philosophy is the interrelated nature of liberation, that I can't secure my release from suffering at someone else's expense. We are all part of one web of humankind, which is in turn part of the web of nature, which is a never-ending cycle of destruction and new beginnings. Many Western thinkers like Pythagoras and Socrates also believed in reincarnation and cyclic existence. Whether or not you believe in reincarnation, it is profoundly sad that we have lost the notion of a common lot with other human beings and other species. This evening, as you breathe deeply and concentrate on this present moment, see all of the processes that go into making your life possible. The food in your stomach comes to you by means of supply chains extending, in many cases, around the world. You breathe the air supplied to you by billions of years of evolutionary change. Realize interconnection and change as the fundamental reality. Allow the dream of ego and duality to dissolve. And that comes from my book, A Mindful Evening. I invite you to pause the recording now for a few minutes of silent meditation. We continue now to our topic for the day. We're continuing our Nine Gates series. If you haven't listened to the other episodes in this series, I would recommend you go back to those before continuing. This one is called Sadak Aspirant. We're going to the second degree in our series of nine degrees. In lessons 2.1 to 2.3, you will be cultivating the good qualities that all spiritual aspirants should treasure. These include generosity, forbearance, patience, and contentment. A sadaka is one who takes the most efficient means to realization, one who has left the beginning stages behind and is firmly and decisively committed to the spiritual path. Confused and wavering consciousness departs, leaving only the sure, strong steps of self-discipline. The gemstone for this rank is citrine. Now we come to the lesson proper. This is called crossing the threshold. At this point in your spiritual life, you have traveled down many paths and have had many blissful and painful experiences. You have practiced many philosophies and religions, some Western and some Eastern, some religious and some secular. Like an actor trying on different costumes, you've been looking for the right fit, for the tradition that just felt right to you. You have reasoned to yourself that you wanted an appropriate level of challenge, something not too difficult and yet not too easy. You have also sought an experience of new spiritual techniques that nonetheless do not require you to abandon your home culture and ethnicity. You are willing to stand out in the crowd, and yet home and family remain important to you. 
You are willing to make bold changes in your life, but you still have a sense of place and community. You are open to ancient and esoteric disciplines, but also value the contributions of modern science. The practices in this lesson will enable you to value the good things that you already have in your life, while simultaneously moving into higher consciousness. You will experience a buoyancy of spirit that allows you to transcend difficulty and rise above the concerns of everyday life without neglecting any of your responsibilities. The universe has many dimensions, many levels of vibration, some gross and some subtle. These layers of reality can be perceived by children and adults alike. On the gross level, a child plays with a wooden toy, say a car, and drags the toy along the carpet on a string. The child is dealing with concrete physical reality and is developing motor dexterity. The physical dexterity will later lead to abstract reasoning, like picturing objects in mathematical and geometric space. Counting on the fingers will come later, which will then become an understanding of number, which will lead to the intangible variables of algebra, trigonometry, and so forth. For now, the child is just playing with a car on a string. But the child already has knowledge of intangibles. The child depends on its parents for food, shelter, and clothing. And through these concrete actions of caring, the child understands love. Loving and caring are intangibles, are subtle realities, and yet they exert an influence in the tangible plane. We say that they have gross and subtle properties. We might say that love, in order to be love, must have both subtle and tangible properties. The parents have a feeling of love in their hearts, to be sure, but they also hug and kiss the child, provide for its needs, and do everything possible to give that small person a good start in life. If the parents fail in this endeavor, that child will have a big deficit to overcome in reaching a stable adulthood. We all have goals that we would like to express to bring into fulfillment. Imagine that I want to learn how to play the guitar. At first, that exists merely as an idle thought in my mind. The thought nonetheless has a non-zero influence on the world. It's a weak intention, but it does have some power. The thought, I want to learn how to play the guitar, might lead me to listen to more music, read magazines about famous guitarists, and things like this. At some point, however, I have to cross various thresholds to actually buy a guitar and plunk away at it, as bad as my playing might sound at first. Then I have to put in hours and hours of practice. Notice that the process can be abandoned at any point along the way. Notice that mastery of a skill is relative and process-dependent. I can master the guitar relative to my next-door neighbor, and that is one level of mastery. But then I could master the guitar relative to Jimi Hendrix or Segovia, and that would be quite a different level of mastery. On the subtle level, I have a goal in mind to be able to play the guitar like so-and-so. But on a gross level, I have the physical activity of guitar playing. These two levels are intrinsically related to one another and, in fact, comprise part of the same phenomenon of guitar playing. Without goals that are mental in nature, I would be unable to accomplish anything on the tangible level. At the same time, without the tangible practice, my mental desires are impotent. To bring this around to the spiritual life, we need examples. We need ideals for the types of spiritual life that we want to bring about. If we have been very lucky in this life, we have examples already. A kind and pious grandmother, a beloved spiritual author, a teacher or a professor, and so forth. These people have become shining lights before us to show the way. We will be doing well to pass along to the next generation the lessons that these beloved forebears passed on to us. We should never take lightly the contributions of our elders, those departed and those still with us. The things that they taught us will be a refuge in times of need. Indeed, we still commune with them when we talk to them in our heads, when we dream of them in the dead of night. 
Those who are still alive, we can simply call on the phone. Those who have passed away, we still honor by cooking their favorite foods or saying their names or putting their pictures around the house. These beloved ones have given us a start in life and showed the way, and this has been a precious gift. We should remember never to defame or disrespect them. And yet, at the same time, we hope to go beyond what we have learned as children, to grow into full adulthood as spiritual beings, to reach the highest expression of divinity our capabilities will allow. We respect our forebears when we accomplish things they never could have imagined, when we take what they have taught us and extend it one step farther. To take that one step farther, the Dharmic traditions offer us help in the form of the devas, the shining ones who show us the way. They help us to access that which is beyond both the gross and subtle layers of existence. They help us to see beyond the mind to the divine reality that supports the entire universe. And yet, because we rely on our material natures to perceive the world, we must approach the divine with the equipment that we have. We must be able to use our five senses plus the mind, the sixth sense, to relate to the increate, intangible divine mind. Just like we have these beloved mentors who have showed us the way in life, the devas show us the way to realities that we have not yet glimpsed. By worshiping them, we harness the senses and the mind, turning these six senses to the higher purpose of self-realization. At this point, it is useful to note that these lessons are called the nine gates. The body is referred to in the Bhagavad Gita as the city of the nine gates. The nine gates are the nine openings in the body, the anus, the genitals, the mouth, the two nostrils, the two ears, and the two eyes. These lessons use the body as a vehicle for bringing the higher consciousness into the material world. Notice also that the name for the spiritual society, the Anahata Chakra Satsanga, has nine ah sounds, some long and some short, which mystically stands for self-effort and receptivity, the two strands of grace. The nine gates are symbolized by nine triangles, which, when combined, form one large triangle, which is drawn in the puja rituals as a triangle with a dot or bindu in the middle, signifying Shiva and Shakti, nature and consciousness, Prakriti and Purusha. This, div- this divine dance of all existence pulses through your body and mind even now as you listen to this talk. The lessons seek to make known what is hidden behind the veil or of maya or illusion to allow you to see what is already the case. We must begin somewhere. We must get started. In the Vedic tradition, the gatekeeper of all knowledge and all wisdom is Ganesha, which is a contraction of Vigneshwara, the divine remover of obstacles. The path of devotion begins with Lord Ganesh, and no one can ascend to the peaks of enlightenment without his permission and blessing. He guards the door to the abode of Shiva Shakti, and he will let no one pass into the mother's chamber unless they are first humbled at his mighty feet. And yet he is also extremely kind and generous, the most accessible of gods and the most valuable of friends. He delights in receiving gifts from his devotees, but he equally delights in giving them treasures from his storehouse. To the materially minded, he gives success and wealth on the gross plane, automobiles, houses, and status. To the spiritually minded, he gives success and wealth in the intangible sense, peace of mind, bliss, and knowledge. He cares for us so much that he allows each person to reach his or her chosen objective, And, in this sense, each person has the help of Ganesha, whether or not he is directly worshipped. Metaphysically speaking, Ganesha can be worshipped as the supreme being, as a demigod, or as a god. One may take a stance on this issue, or one may simply worship Ganesh without worrying about where he falls on the heavenly hierarchy. The important thing is that while one is worshipping him, One must strive as much as possible to exclude other thoughts and concentrate one's attention on him alone. 
For his devotees, realizing Ganesh becomes the goal. We seek to emulate his qualities and bring them into our lives. A kind of cross-pollinization happens in which we contemplate him in spiritual practice and allow that contemplation to inform our daily living and vice versa. Begin Ganesha devotion with his 108 names. You might wish to start with an audio or video version of the names while following along yourself with the translation and transliteration. When you find yourself comfortable with the recorded version, try chanting by yourself out loud. At first, it will take you a long time to chant all of the names. Keep doing this until you feel more and more comfortable with chanting. Eventually, you'll get to the point where you can chant either out loud or silently with ease. You don't need to go very fast, just accomplish a comfortable pace that enables correct pronunciation. You need not obsess over pronunciation either, just do the best you can. The gods will understand as they speak in the language of the heart. It can take years to master classical Sanskrit pronunciation, so just try your best for now. Try to infuse your chanting with devotional feeling as much as you can. Picture yourself at Ganesha's feet as he dances or sits before you. As you chant the names, you will identify more with some of them than others. This will depend on the issues that arise in your life at the time of chanting. The appropriate name will seem to leap off the page and will be imbued with special significance for you. Make note of any special names like this, as you may want to return later to say an entire mala, that is, 108 repetitions, of the one that really speaks to you. Ganesha can communicate with you through mantra practice, and he may be giving you an important lesson by revealing to you an appropriate mantra for that day. If you already have a Ganesha idol and a home shrine, use this place for your practice. If you don't, you can find a picture of Ganesh or even draw one yourself and use that to help you visualize his form. You'll find it easier to meditate on him in this way, far easier than trying to clear your mind or meditate on formlessness. The god with form, Saguna Brahman, is the first step to finding the god without form, Nirguna Brahman. By meditating on the personal deity, you form a staircase or ladder that will eventually lead you to the formless absolute. The eternal dharmic tradition simply disagrees with the Abrahamic religions when they insist that God is never to be pictured as having form. It is only by envisioning such forms or worshipping idols that we can rise to the contemplation of ultimate reality. All religious and secular people worship idols. Hindus just do so consciously and with the correct goal in mind. Saying mantras and visualizing Lord Ganesha is a time-honored and proven way to establish the divinity within. Once you have become comfortable with the 108 names, you may wish to picture him seated at the base of the spine in the muladhara or root chakra. This chakra is associated with the earth element and the pull of gravity. Whether you are sitting in a chair or cross-legged on the floor, feel yourself rooted in the gravitational pull of the earth. Then picture Lord Ganesha seated atop the chakra. He is giving you good timing, inspiring you with right action, and filling your heart with devotion. The names as you chant them fill your entire body and finally, the whole cosmos. The sacred sounds, which have no beginning or end, connect you with that which is. You should finally feel that you are not the one chanting, but that you have simply stumbled across these sounds, which have always been there. You do not produce the sounds. You simply join in them. In fact, the sounds have produced you, and you will one day return into them. It is possible to chant while working or driving in a car, but try to set aside some time, at least one mala, for chanting each day with minimal distractions. You'll find it easier over time to get into the meditative frame of mind, especially if you chant regularly at the same place and time. Lord Ganesha will meet you there, 
and you will quickly feel his calming presence. When you are established in the practice of the 108 names, you can try a more simplified japa mantra, like Om Gum Ganapateye Namaha. This mantra means something like, Om, we bow to the Lord of the servants of God. The symbol Gum is the root sound for Lord Ganesha, while the Om is the mantra of mantras, the seed sound of all mantras. It refers to the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the universe, or the three divine pairings of Brahma Saraswati, Vishnu Lakshmi, and Shiva Parvati, or the beginning, middle, and end of all things. So with each repetition of the mantra Om, the entire created universe is born and dies again. The pulse of the universe is right there in your hand as you hold your mala, and the whole universe courses through your breath and your vocal cords. Students of the Western mysteries may note here the hermetic principle, as above, so below, as within, so without. The microcosm, the body, becomes a model of the macrocosm, the universe. The gross world becomes a model of the divine world. You will feel a remarkable sense of privilege to be able to participate in this wonderful drama that is unfolding across all of existence. Your part, though small, contains the whole. An even simpler version of this mantra is Om Shri Ganeshaya Namaha. Om Shri Ganeshaya Namaha. The meaning of the syllable Shri has been explored in an earlier lesson. It means wealth, increase, or respect. Ganesha, as, as has been stated above, is a contraction of Vigneshwara, the remover of obstacles. Ganesha is the deity with an elephant head. You might wish to picture an elephant charging ahead of you through the jungle, removing all obstacles from your path. An elephant's trunk is extremely strong and can uproot trees, but is also extremely nimble and can pick up a needle. So there's no problem too big or too small for Ganesh to handle. Whether the situation requires brute strength or precise intervention, Ganesh knows the solution and can help you with it. While practicing mantra, all you need to do is open yourself to this wisdom. The time for action will come later. For now, just concentrate on the deity. You may begin to notice some fruits of your practice. You begin to do the right thing at the right time more easily. You have a more cheerful disposition. You don't get upset as easily. You don't react with anger as often. Don't be dismayed if you don't notice any changes right away. Try to be detached from the fruits of your practice. Allow Ganesha to move at his own pace and in his own way. Your job is simply to be faithful and keep in mind that you still have to act in the world. In fact, you should be more diligent than before in performing all of your duties. Ganesh can provide you with the occasional nudge, but it is your job to carry out the work. The work that you do today, whether it is the work of mantra practice or your regular work in the world, may take days, months, or years to come to fruition. For your part, work on moving efficiently and without hesitation towards complete enlightenment. We move now into the assignments. The first two you will just complete on your own, and you don't need to submit any feedback. Here's the first one. As you say the 108 names of Ganesha each day, which names speak to you the most? How do these names reflect what is happening in your life right now? And if you need a copy of the 108 names, you can get a copy of my book, which is called at Ganapati's Feet, Daily Life with the Elephant-Headed Deity, or you can simply look up the 108 names on the web. So say them and then ask yourself how these reflect what's happening in your own life. Assignment number two, the marks of this rank are generosity, forbearance, patience, and contentment. Which of these qualities is most present in your life? Which ones do you need to explore more fully? How can you bring them into prominence? In your daily routines. Now we come to the next set of questions for self-reflection. If you're interested in moving through the formal system of ranks of the satsanga, please uh, get into contact with me 
You might send me a message on Twitter or email me, and we'll go ahead and get you signed up as a member of the society. And I'll also send you a patch, which is uh, of the Heart Chakra Mandala, and it has uh, Anahata Chakra Satsanga on it. You can put this patch on your yoga bag or on your book bag, and we'll go ahead and get you uh, moving through the ranks of the society doing these lessons. So the first question is, have you fully committed to pursuing the spiritual path in front of you? What reservations still lurk in your heart and mind? How can you address these reservations? Second, did you notice any large or small changes in your life when you started doing Ganesh Mantra? Describe them in detail. And three, Ganesha is the Lord of good timing. In what ways do you see things falling into place in your life right now? Why do you think you have come to be studying these lessons at this particular time? And some, some books for further reading, as I mentioned, uh, At Ganapati's Feet, Daily Life with the Elephant-Headed Deity. My book is for, published by Mantra Books in uh, 2014. Another good book is by Royina Gruel, and it's called The Book of Ganesha. Um, and it was published by Penguin India in 2001. Another good book that I recommend is by my guru, Swami Satyananda Saraswati, and Vitalananda Saraswati, and it's called The Cosmic Puja. It's an advanced puja that we're gonna, going to get to later in this series, but if you read the introduction to that book, the philosophical explanations are very useful for beginners. Thank you for listening to this series. That's all for today's show. Please subscribe and leave a review on your favorite platform. The theme music was by Tommy Rooster. Intro voiceover by Kimberly Hash DeVries. Zafir Dar on piano. Hafiz Shabazz Rashid on tabla. That's all for now. Have a mindful day.